Hi, this is Terrence, Gilbert, and Lily from Alex's Puppet Palace. And you're watching a podcast where nostalgia comes to life. It's Empire Time! It's not Empire Time, Gilbert. It's Jake's Happy Nostalgia Show Time. Roll it, Jakey Bap. Roll it! Welcome to Jake's Happy Nostalgia Show, the podcast where nostalgia comes alive. Since July of 2021, Jake and his friends have interviewed professionals in the worlds of acting, directing, writing, puppeteering, and many more. Who will they be chatting with in this week's interview? Find out in this Jake's Happy Nostalgia Show episode. Hey everyone, welcome to this episode of Jake's Happy Nostalgia Show, where nostalgia comes alive. I'm your host, Jake Duffelball. I'm going to tell you sorry, so host Chris Fixby, and Matt Bingo with his pal, Moy Monster. How you guys doing? Doing good, doing good. Hello everybody. Hi folks. How you doing, Jakey? Chris Free here. I'm doing great. As always, thank you for asking, Mari and Matt. Chris, what do we have for today? Very excited for today's guest. She is a former puppeteer and actress on Sesame Street. You may know her as the original performer of Zoe in Prairie Dawn, a whole bunch of other characters. We're here to talk about that, some of her theater work. And here she is, Fran Brill. Fran, happy to have you here. Nice to be here. Awesome. Awesome. So to kick things off, so in your own words, could you tell our audience a little bit about yourself and your career? Uh, sure. Um, <clears throat> well, let's see. Uh, in terms of Sesame Street, I was the very first um, puppeteer to be hired. Uh, Jane Henson did precede me, but she, uh, well, let's just say she was there very, very briefly when Sesame Street started. And then um, I got hired and uh I worked for Sesame Street on and off for a very long time and uh, really just, you know, fell into this job having never played with a puppet in my life. It was just one crazy thing. Um, but I came to New York and um, with a Broadway show that closed after about 41 performances and uh, in making the rounds, trying to get an agent, that sort of thing, um, I realized that I could do all sorts of voices and character voices because I started doing voiceovers. And uh, I guess it was an agent who said to me, you know, Fran, Jim Henson is looking to train puppeteers for an upcoming television special. And uh, I had watched the show this first year that I came to New York, uh, which was the first season of Sesame Street. And I thought, oh, you know, they'll use me as a voice. You know, I could, I probably, they could use me to do cartoons that were on the show or animations rather. And I never thought that I would end up being a puppeteer of all things, but um, they were doing this workshop and they were paying people to take the workshop. And at that time, any kind of money sounded good to me. Uh, so I uh, auditioned for Jim and Frank um, at, at the Jim Henson headquarters. And uh, it was really very comfy. You didn't feel like an audition at all. Uh, you know, Jim was very, very low key and kind of talk like that, you know, and um, they had a, a big trunk of puppets and they had a wall to searing, ceiling mirror. And so at one point after schmoozing for a little while, asking, they were asking about myself and uh, I, uh, so they said, well, why don't you put a puppet on and, you know, see what you can do. And I thought, oh my God. So I stuck my hand into this box and pulled up a puppet. I wish I could remember which one it was. It was an anything Muppet probably. Mm -hmm. And um, so yeah. there were some scripts and uh, we kind of improvised off of the scripts. And then Jim's would give me little things like, you know, try a different voice, uh, do a different voice, um, try another character. You know, I think he just wanted to see what my range was, what my abilities were, at least with that. And, uh, you know, I remember laughing and uh, it was all really easy peasy and I left. And then a couple of weeks later, I got the call saying, you know, if you would like, uh, 
you know, we'd like you to do the workshop. So that's where I met Richard Hunt, who also was a wannabe puppeteer. Yeah, that's how that started. So Richard and I both made it through the two weeks of training, which was mostly lip syncing to a mirror and um, lip syncing to music. Just the basic fundamentals, you know, trying to keep the eyes focused on the uh, camera and not, you know, a head wandering all over. And um, so Richard and I then did the workshop and then Jim asked both of us if we wanted to do this, you know, um, television show, Christmas television show. So we did that. And then after that was over, Jim asked Richard and I if we wanted to do Sesame Street. So I was all about, you know, oh, gosh, you know, Jim, I'm really an actress. I, I you know, I don't really want to be a puppet here. Um, and he said, well, you know, we'll, we'll just work around your schedule. And I mean, he was very accommodating and super nice. And that's what happened. Um, so this is kind of fun. So the first day of Sesame Street, now this is the sequence. I graduate from college. I do this, I, I, I mean, I graduate from college. I go to New York with this Broadway show. The show closes uh, in the winter. In the summer, I do the workshop. Uh, I think that was June. July is when we shot it in Toronto. And then September, I'm on the set of Sesame Street. So wow. it was pretty fast and really unusual. And uh, when I stepped onto the Sesame Street soundstage, I look across and there is Will Lee, who was my acting teacher oh. at Boston University. And he's oh. playing. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, oh. it was, yeah, it was amazing. So he said, what are you doing here? And I said, what are you doing here? And yeah. uh, <laughs> it was it was so bizarre. It was just so bizarre. So that's that's kind of how it all began. Nice. Awesome. That's that's a small world. <laughs> really, oh, well, really. It's, a, it's it's a crazy world and really, you know, it's like stay open to any and all opportunities that come your way and ride in the direction the horse is going, which is another thing that I've learned uh, with my careers. Um, you know, you may want to be a cabaret singer, but really your talent is making umbrellas. I don't know, but <laughs> it helps to ride in the direction the horse is going. So you don't waste your entire life pursuing something that really is not a good fit. Of course. Um, right. But, but a lot of people do, you know, and then finally they get realistic. But anyway, it was just, uh, a crazy time and I really learned how to puppeteer on the job. Uh, I mean, the guys were really nice to me, which I was very fortunate because I thought they would just go, you know, what is she doing here? Because it was five guys and me. Um, but uh, they were really nice and uh, they helped me a lot. And Jim was very patient and, you know, they finally got a female basically. Um, I don't know. I don't know actually if they ever would have gotten a female, but the producers of Sesame Street said we have to get a female puppeteer because the guys can't keep doing, um, you know, their voice in falsetto playing female characters. We need to have because it was women's lib at that time and mm -hmm. a whole lot of changes in society. So I became the person that they needed to hire um, because it just didn't look good that, <laughs> that they were just all these male puppeteers and not a realistic representation of a female played by a female. Mm -hmm. right. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. That makes sense. So before becoming a puppeteer and actress, how did you grow up and what was your childhood like? Oh, uh, well, my childhood was, I think, fairly normal. Uh, but when I was a brownie, I our troop number 303 uh, did a play in which 
we were all playing, you know, teenagers. I mean, what was I, nine? I have no idea what I was as a brownie, maybe younger. And uh, we did a play and I got cast as sort of this great aunt. So I had the idea to come on and with a cane and a gray skirt and a wig and played, let's say, a real character role. And uh, the audience just broke up laughing hysterically. And I said, I like this. I like the fact that I am getting laughter back and it's not laughing at me. It's laughter that's approval. And that kind of, that crazy little play is really what kind of got me going. So I ended up doing, you know, plays in high school. I went away and did summer stock when I was 16. Um, I, I got the ball rolling as soon as my parents would let me. I did community theater, of course. And then I majored in drama at Boston University uh, where I got my BFA. And then I came to New York with a Broadway show because I had gone to Theater Atlanta, which doesn't exist now, as a journeyman to get my equity equity card. And we got we had a show called Red, White, and Maddox, which was a satirical musical spoof on the governor at that time, Lester Maddox, who was very bigoted and would not like uh, let uh, African Americans into his restaurant. And that show got reviewed nationally. I mean, my whole life has just been coincidence. And then we moved that show to Broadway. So uh, it was all just, you know, you couldn't plan this if you tried. So that's what put me in New York. And then once I was in New York, I began scrambling to get any kind of work that I could do just to pay the bills and get an apartment that I could pay for. Definitely. And I know, um, so speaking of uh, theater, some of your other theatrical roles include uh, leads at the Roundabout Theater and the Manhattan Theater Club. What, what were those performances like? Oh, uh, well, they were, you know, there, there are wonderful off-Broadway theaters in New York. And um, I did a lot of stuff at Playwrights Horizons, which is quite well known. A lot of stuff, you know, gets started there and then gets moved to Broadway if they get good reviews. Um, let me think what would be interesting. Uh, I did a play go called Defective Gamma Rays on Man in the Moon Marigolds. Have you ever heard of that? It's a very weird title. A little bit, yeah. And then I did the first company of that in Washington, D.C., and that was when I was commuting from Sesame Street in Queens. Oh, it may have been in New York at that time, but anyway, I had to get on an airplane to Washington DC where I was doing that play. That was my, <laughs> my first September working on Sesame Street. So I was doing a play at night in Washington DC and then going back to Sesame Street. It was all oh, crazy, crazy. <laughs> Definitely. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm kind of curious. Do you remember the very first character you performed on Sesame? Uh, yeah, I do. Um, I'm pretty sure it was a little bird. Uh, oh, yeah, which, yeah. 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 I mean, that was given to me, but um, I'm going to say that's what was the first character who is Big Bird's friend. You know, basically, he's so huge. <laughs> right. and, Little Bird was so small. Uh, I don't remember. I know I was doing right hands for Frank, you know. I mean, they were kind, They were slow with me. They, it's not like they said, here she is, and we're going to give her a roll right away. Because right. I had to learn the ropes. I mean, I, I you know, I just had, we had cables back then that were attached to us. So we were, you know, if we were doing a group number, you know, I had to be careful not to fall over. They had to make boots for me, which are now at the Museum of the Moving Image in New York. Oh, yeah, uh, yeah. They had to reinvent oh. the wheel when all of a sudden a female came on board. And I was 5'4", and most of the guys were 
six feet, six one, something like that. So if I was standing next to them, I had to be, my hand had to be right up there with them. So they invented these, what they got are these regular pair of like winter boots. And then they did about, I don't know if you can see this from there, about a six inch platform that was glued to the boot. So I wore those all day long so that I could uh, get up to their level. Um, let's see, there were all sorts of accommodations back then. I mean, I know I did, I knew I did most anything that was a female. Uh, right. There was a puppet called Betty Lou who had pigtails. Yeah. Oh, yes. And she kind of morphed into Roxy Marie at some point because Oh yeah, Roxy Marie. Yeah. <laughs> yes, Roxy people Marie. got confused when they they would because there were books, Sesame Street books coming out at the time, you know, uh, for children to read, and they would have this character in pigtails that was blonde, and they got her confused with Prairie Dawn, or it was it was kind of well, it was confusing. So we made Betty Lou this friend of Prairie Dawn, but she really was the same puppet as Prairie, but with a different wig on, you know? Right. And then I think mm -hmm. I tried to do a different voice. Um, and then they dropped Betty Lou because it was so confusing. Oh dear. <laughs> you know, it's inventing the wheel. That's all I can say. It's like anything new. You just, it's like AI. I mean, for God's sakes, yeah. things are just going to mm -hmm. change because it's new. And that's what life is all about, is change and adapting to the new normal. And they, you know, they just had to figure out how to use me and what puppets were doing well. Um, but I'm going to say that uh, that that little bird was really the first one. And I would say about six or eight months into working on the show, uh, Jim came to me with this little pink puppet and she already had a little dress on uh, that was a typical little girl's dress really from I don't know it had smocking if you know what that is anyway that was the original dress that Prairie Dawn wore and he said we want you to create a, the quintessential sweet little girl and that was Prairie and even though I tried, you know, um, because of my personality and I'm not really a docile, sweet, you know, innocent, she got stronger and stronger over the years. Um, but that that was my first real character after Little Bird was Prairie Dawn. Nice. Nice. So, yeah, with uh, Prairie Dawn, like... Uh... What was it like kind of doing the uh, pageant segments oh, with her? I love those. I wish they had kept yes. on doing them forever. I just thought they were so funny because here is this tiny little female puppet playing the piano badly. And she's <laughs> bossing, you know, Bert and Ernie and whoever, Cookie mm. Monster, Grover. Yeah. You know, uh -huh. I, I just love those. I thought they were so clever, you know, teaching the no. seasons and... I can't remember what, you know, I mean, they were funny. They're still funny to me now if if I watch them. <laughs> right. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Some of the segments I remember where, I think you might know what I'm talking about, Chris, where I remember, I remember from Play With Sesame, really, but, but, um, Oh, Play With Sesame. It's like, yeah, yeah, which, I, yeah, which, yeah. which I know that segment was also featured for that series as well. Um, yeah. where it's basically where Cookie Monster wants want, uh, wants to wants to steal like Prairie Dawn's cookie, and then right. he has like a temper tantrum, and then and then imagine <laughs> from going to jail or, or, or steal steal yeah. her cookie. Oh yeah, <laughs> oh, there are a lot. Of, but that's right between Prairie Dawn and Cookie. Yeah. That was oh yeah. Um, after yeah. Frank left, I think that the most of those were done with Dave Rudman. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. But even at the beginning, um, Prairie and, well, I don't know. I mean, I know you're too young for this, but if you, you probably got clips from way, way back when. But we did a lot of 
Prairie and Cookie Monster doing Monster Piece Theater. You remember? Yeah, yes. yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, yes. Now those, uh -huh. those were really clever there. Oh, yeah. Uh, and that was a lot of fun because Frank was always being naughty with Prairie and, you know, we're just, he just cracks the whole setup, you know, he's just a funny, funny, yeah. but very guy. Oh yeah. And the, yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. And the, and the cookie game too. Yeah. Where, 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 where cookie was like, like trying, was thinking if that's a cookie, but instead he, he ate the, the telephone, the telephone. Oh yeah. 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 One yeah. of my yeah. favorite, uh, Prairie inserts was the one that she did with uh, Grover singing in the rain. I was about to mention oh, that, Chris. Yeah. Oh. You beat me to it. That's you know, a classic. <laughs> oh, yes. My puppeteering is pretty <laughs> ugly, but it was such a cute idea. And I have that on a reel. Like if I do talks for people, you know, I mean, uh, Kiwanis or any, you know, I've, I've done a lot of talks over the years. And um, that's on the reel because everybody knows Singing in the Rain, you know, from the movie. And it's a very, very funny, well-written bit. I wonder who wrote that, actually. It could have been Tony Geis or... Oh, yeah, yeah. I'm sure I could find out. One of the original writers. Um, but, I, yeah, those, are, those were great for Prairie. They really used her in a wonderful way back then and then i think they decided she got too bossy or something like that or what they thought is bossy <sighs> you know every time there's a new executive producer they want to reinvent the wheel so what's been good is now not good and what's been you know they just want to keep changing things so anyway mm -hmm. i got off the subject that's okay <laughs> no worries from there so now, you know, Prairie Dawn has also been seen in her own segments, including the adventures of Prairie Dawn and fairy tales today. Can you talk a bit about those? Oh, wow. You know what? I forgot all about those. You're right. I don't remember them. <laughs> Do you, can you remind me of one of them? Can you remember? Oh, uh, so, the, so the adventures of uh, Prairie Dawn is, uh, well, I remember there was one uh, where Prairie was like, trying to like turn off the tv to like save energy or something that was one i remember but they were like dumb weren't they i mean they were yeah. like they were yeah. not a big idea they were mm -hmm. like uh closing the door or something like that mm -hmm. that was her adventure yeah That's what yeah and then fairy tales today was where prairie uh interview like it's like a news thing and she interviews like different fairy tale characters like the big bad wolf Goldilocks, Rapunzel. Right, right. Yeah, I vaguely remember those. Yeah, those, those are some fun ones. Yeah, I'm Absolutely. sure. Yes, <laughs> yeah, definitely. So, yes. so now since we talked about uh, doing the sketches with other characters, let's move on to uh, another one of your uh, best-known characters, Zoe. How was she created? Ah, well, Zoe was the first time in in my knowledge that they created a puppet that didn't come from being an anything Muppet. For instance, Baby Bear was just a puppet of a bear, okay? Yeah. And, and Dave mm -hmm. Rudman did that puppet in a Goldilocks sequence. And whatever he did, whatever spin he put on Goldilocks, the writers and the producers liked so then Baby Bear, who was really an anything Muppet, became a principal character for a while. So with Zoe, there was no puppet. So like often if I had to play an anything Muppet and they had a whole bunch of anything Muppets there at the beginning of the day and you would just go look at them and decide, oh, I want to do this one. Uh, but it was it already existed. But with Zoe, it was zero all they did is this is when i came back to sesame street in 19 it was either 90 or 93 and um, michael loman was the producer at the time and he said we need elmo to have a really good female friend so <laughs> they wanted zoe or this this pal to be spunky and do all the things the boys did and play with trains 
And uh, of course, I started thinking, well, if she's doing all of this boyish stuff and she doesn't even look like a female, why did they come up with this character? So I fought very hard to make her look like a female. So the first thing they did is they put beads on her neck and they put bracelets on her. And then she began to have little sparkly stuff in her hair. Then she began to have more hair uh, because it just, I, I, it just didn't make sense to me that they had a female character who, yeah, was the opposite of Prairie and that Prairie was girly girly, you know? Right. Uh, so then they just sort of wanted Zoe to not be that, to be spunky and proud and, Anyway, it, it it was it was difficult for me. So I created this character really out of nothing. I hmm. I went around to some nursery schools and watched some kids behaving and kind of got that <laughs> laugh, you know, going and don't joke me, which I heard a kid say. And I, you know, I just sort of put things together and you know she had this very wide ernie like mouth puppet style wise mm -hmm. so at first i was trying to sound like carol channing which was just god awful and so it took me kind of a while and then really when kevin and i started to improvise with um zoe and elmo that's when i started to see who she might be I mean, I had no idea, but it was whatever came out of my mind and into my hand. Uh, I just found her saying things to Elmo and, you know, Kevin would react as Elmo. And so that's 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 really the only way you find a character, I think, is to improvise with the character. And you just let it happen. You just let it. I, I don't know. I call it channeling you kind of just stay open and you don't criticize yourself. You just say, you know, okay, I'm trying to find out who, who this character is. Let her come out. Let her speak to me. It's all very, ooh, but you know, uh, that seems to be what happens. Right. Definitely. Yep. Absolutely. Yes. I mean, do you, don't you agree that that's? Oh yeah, it, yeah, absolutely, oh, yeah. absolutely. Yes. And the and the inner catchphrase, "Don't joke me." I think that's one of the best things ever. I love whenever absolutely. She says that. <laughs> yes, yeah, pretty on so you know, great, great characters. And you well, know, I wish they could have done shows together. It would have been interesting. Oh my god, yes, that'd I be know. awesome. How do you do would that? Have been interesting. Yeah, yeah. Right, I guess you right. could do a script and have somebody puppeteer. Yeah. The other one you know but uh yeah would have been oh. interesting just to see if they got along i don't know yeah, yeah we, we, we talked to idea. we talked to a uh, stephanie kind of about that in the past so sometimes when zoe and prairie would be written in a script together sometimes she'd put on either zoe or prairie <laughs> depending on who has the most lines well that's mm -hmm. that's very true i'm i'm glad she did that um I don't know how else you would do it. Yeah, and now, and now she, and now she is buried on. She, and yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. inherited yeah, that role and does a great job. And same think... for Jen Barnhart with Zoe. Oh yeah, yeah, they're doing they're doing amazing. Oh good, amazing so job. we'll see. I'm not really watching the show anymore. You know, I left, right. and it sort of becomes something that is in and, your past. Yeah, in the past, yeah. But yeah. I'm glad to hear that um, because I know. Yeah. My the voice that I did for Zoe was difficult for Jen to get a hold of, but I think she's yeah. found a compromise. I mean, yeah. I don't that that voice is a real um, pinching of the vocal cords, and she she had. I mean, I think she has a deeper natural voice than I do. I think I don't know, but anyway, I'm glad that they're both doing it, and I'm glad that the characters are still alive. That's really what Absolutely. I absolutely. Absolutely. You know, and if, matters, they're, you know. if they're yeah. writing for them, that's wonderful. I would have hated for those characters to just die, you know. Right. That would have right. Been... Oh, yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. Yeah. Chime with Stephanie and Jennifer. Yeah. They're, Don't they're you guys get sick of this people. show ever? Do you, I mean, do you both watch it like regularly? No kidding. Wow. <laughs> mm hmm. 
all right, well, you know, that's great. I, I should probably try to watch it myself. You know, <laughs> awesome. I, here's a good show. Uh, no. <laughs> 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 So, so if we don't want to, it's totally fine. But we were wondering if we can hear a bit of Prairie Dawn and Zoe. Uh, all right. Uh, no. <laughs> hi, hi, Prairie Dawn. Hi, Prairie. Hi, Prairie. Hello, <laughs> gentlemen. <laughs> How are you? Uh, I'm feeling very well, thank you. And you? We're doing very good. We're good. Doing really good. It's always very ridiculous good. You. when you do this, especially to a child. Because they look at you, because I get mothers that get, come over here. This is the lady that does Brewery Dawn, you know. And <laughs> looking at me. And uh, it, it just does not make sense. I'm not sure I'm going to do too much more of that here, but it, it, it mm -hmm. feels. <laughs> It feels wrong without the puppet. You know? Right, that's fair. Yeah. Yeah. Right, the, I totally, I totally get that. You know, yeah. you know, we we had uh, we had Cheryl Blaylock on in the past, and when she did Eureka's voice, she asked us to close our eyes. Which yeah, makes right. sense. I mean, it yeah. Make, yeah. it makes it feel more real. At least. Well, she's absolutely yeah. right. Of course, yeah. I know Frank refuses to ever just do the voice. Right, right. Because it, right. it just feels wrong. You know. Well, yeah. It is wrong it's sort of a betrayal of a character right of a puppet right yeah definitely I get you i get you you're definitely. not offended by that are you no good <laughs> <laughs> uh so so i'm curious do you have any favorite inserts or episodes that you got to do with zoe uh you mean ones that i remember or were, were proud yeah. of yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Yeah, there. Uh, well, the one that comes to mind right away is, um, well, there. You know, there were shows that I did with some celebrities that were special, um, but there was also a show that they wrote. I don't know if you do you remember when Zoe had her Zoe mobile. Yes, of yes. course. Yes. Yeah, classic. Another, Great dropped. episodes. Uh, yeah. Well. I remember that uh, there was a show they somebody wrote for Baby Bear and Telly and Zoe. And Zoe had her Zoe mobile and Telly and Baby Bear wanted to borrow it so they could drive around. And <laughs> Zoe was very, very uh, concerned about that. And really did not want them to get in her Zoe mobile. And she was right because they crashed it after they, uh, after she let them do that. And they had to uh, talk amongst themselves and decide what to do about this problem in that they had crashed it. So the two characters decided that they had to come clean. <laughs> So they went to Zoe and they told her, um, I mean, I'm trying to remember how this went, but they told her that they had crushed the Zoe mobile and she got very, very sad. I mean, like crying sad. And I just thought that was, uh, it was, it was all about, um, let's see, what is the word? Forgiving, I guess, forgiving somebody who done you wrong, you know? They, she had been nice. She had lent them the Zoe mobile. They crashed it, but now they felt really badly about it. So it's now your job to forgive them for <laughs> crashing the Zoe mobile. Right. And I, I just thought it was a really nice script. I thought it was a great idea. And I liked that they had Zoe be, I don't know if mature is the right word for it, but, uh, but to be nice about it and not scream and yell and, you know, hit them, uh, but to right. accept it and, and got tearful over it. That, that was one show that I really liked. Oh, I don't know. I think all the stuff with Rocco was a lot of fun. Oh my uh, gosh. <laughs> <laughs> yes. It's so funny how that yes. blew up, you know, Joey. I know. Yes, no. I wrote yeah. like, a show for Zoe with a rock and then it just developed into this 
whole little game yeah. where Zoe would uh, <laughs> pretend it was real and tease Elmo rather mercilessly. And Elmo did not like it. <laughs> no. Yeah, I guess oh, rare. no. Yeah, I but guess it so. gave Elmo a chance to have another dimension to him. Instead of being just yeah. sweet old Elmo all the time, he got frustrated. Oh, he got yeah. Angry. He got oh, a wealth gosh. of new emotions. And I thought that was great for Sesame Street and for his character. Absolutely. Uh, to give him a little bit more dimension. Yeah. Um, and we had such fun, of course, doing it. Yeah. You know, I, uh -huh. I, some of those clips are on the reel that I use too, because I think they're really funny. I think the one that I have is where Zoe. They're doing a, like a circus ringmaster thing. And Elmo is the ringmaster and it's got this costume on. And Zoe has Elmo as uh, Rocco dressed like a clown. Oh, and wow. Do you remember that one at all? I, I think I so. Know. I think yeah. I do. That's oh, pretty, my gosh. And pretty, want... pretty goofy. Um, <laughs> but, you know, we just had a, a lot of fun doing those scripts you know oh yes uh, um so that that stuff that i think was fun um i i don't know can't remember anymore no the, well the episode that zoe debuted in was really cool the one where they introduced like all the around the corner sets in the playground and, oh yeah uh, when the when the playground 25. first happened. yeah mm -hmm. those mm -hmm. are beautiful yeah. those are beautiful sets oh yeah they were, but these the kids didn't really go home. Mommy, mommy, this is Sesame Street is so much better now with all these sets. You know, I, I'm yeah. afraid it's a very, very expensive experiment. And I think they realized there were too many locations, too many characters. Children just need a few characters to glom onto. And pretty soon that whole set was jettisoned. However, the good thing is that Zoe got her tutu at that time yes. because of the ballet mm -hmm. dance studio. And once she got into that tutu, I said, you know, this is so great. Uh, just like Ernie and Bert always wear the same clothes all the time. How about if we have Zoe just wear this tutu all the time? For one thing, it makes her look like a little girl. And yeah. and it's a it's just a you know a catchy little thing for her, so uh, they agreed you know and and so she you know we had a lot of dance shows because she didn't dance particularly well. Uh, of course, no child of that age is going to be a fantastic ballet dancer, but it, it gave them ideas for for you know it's a symbiosis the writers and the performers just giving each other I think ideas and see what works um but that's when they had gosh those two characters that were in front of a a building gosh i know dave redmond did one of them oh uh humphrey and ingrid yes so. yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. humphrey and ingrid for god's sakes and then there was benny the rabbit uh, oh Benny yes. Rabbit. funny character i love that yes. oh, great. Um, yes. they were just all these new characters and sets <laughs> it was it was pretty zany uh, i don't even remember how long that lasted but um i did i do think uh the fix it did the fix it shop come out of that or did that always exist i think that always exists laundromat. the laundromat. laundromat yeah laundromat yeah that was the 20 season 25 Mm -hmm. And they did keep they did keep that as a location, the laundromat. But all the rest of that stuff, I don't know what they did with those sets because we went back to one, two, three Sesame Street, Big Bird's Nest, Mr. Hooper's store, and the Fix It Shop. Just a simple, you know, we went back to all that simplicity. Right. Yeah. And, and Oscar's can, of course. Yeah. Of course. Right. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Some of the, the Elmo and Zoe and Rocco uh, times where <laughs> where one of them were um, where Elmo was like, this planet is over. Where are you going? And then Elmo was like, Alaska. 
That was that was that wasn't a Rocco thing. That was a Zoe movie. Yeah, so, so, remember? So, so remember? Yeah, yeah, was, yeah, so, yeah, maybe, yeah. Well, that thing, yeah. But I, um, I don't remember that. And she's that's where she wanted to go in her Zoe mobile was Alaska. Uh, yeah, and no, then well, yeah, well, well, Elmo yeah. wanted to, and Zoe said, yeah. "It's faster if you drive." Yeah, faster if you drive. Yeah, they were. I think it was the episode where uh, Elmo wanted to ride in the Zoe mobile and Zoe wouldn't Zoe said no. let him. Okay. And well, so the, they ended up having like a little argument about it. Yeah. Okay. And the, yeah. And I know it's definitely you know, Rocco. <laughs> uh, what season, what season? Is, 30? Um, it was yeah. 30? The 30, I think mm -hmm. it was. Yeah. How yeah. Would you we're, remember? We're, uh, we're almost about to say like the number of the day and then and I was like, Rock, 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 the day is 12. Yeah. Oh, that, that was the Rocco episode, one of them. Yes. Yeah. And that's then great. Elmo just had a little, like, like a you little guys, like, face. You guys have <laughs> much better memory than I do of all those. And I, again, I don't know why that Zoe <laughs> mobile got dropped. Maybe people just couldn't think of enough scripts to write for it or something. I have no idea. Maybe. But maybe. You could never get two puppeteers in that thing. It was yeah. lying on my back, of course. With my hand up in the air, I mean, it was it was, and I'm 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 five four, so I'm small, but there was absolutely no room for anybody else in that thing. It was fairly uncomfortable to be in. Mm. So that's why Zoe didn't want anybody in there. Right. <laughs> that's well, why Zoe answer. didn't want anybody in yeah. there. They would have had now. to rock on the hood. I'm afraid. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I speak of Rocco. I had an interesting theory recently yeah. um, about Rocco. Um, how I guess kind of how Rocco came about, maybe. Um, if you, if you, some of you viewers and listeners remember Pet Rocks, they were these old toys like back Absolutely. in the seventies. Absolutely, I remember Pet Rocks. Uh, I I had an interesting idea. Like, what if, like, what if Zoe's mom and dad had a pet rock, and like mm -hmm. Zoe was so fascinated by it that Zoe was like, "I want my own pet rock," and hence Rocco. Maybe I really don't Maybe. remember. I don't remember the first show when Zoe had Rocco, and I would have to ask Joey Mazzarino if he remembers because he's the one that really started the whole Rocco thing. Uh, oh, yeah. Maybe because he's of an age where he would know about the pet rock craze. Uh, yeah, that right. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I don't know. Right. Interesting he thought. Would, I like it. He would, <laughs> yeah, he would, that'd be awesome, though. If they, did if you they ever did interview uh, Joey Mazzarino? No. Oh, no, but that'll be, no. it'll be great. He is and, just he's just one of my favorite people in the whole world. Um, and great. uh he just yeah, amazing wrote, love, amazing, he wrote the amazing best things. scripts. Yeah, and his just characters were amazing too. Yeah, what was? his his too? characters were amazing too. Like Murray, uh, Stinky, Murray. The Stinkweed. Oh my yes. gosh! Oh mm -hmm. yeah, I love Stinky. He was super. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He wrote and, different house plants. I mean, he, you know, all of those parodies we did. I love the parodies. Oh yeah, yeah. Oh yeah. I think all of that is gone now because they decided that it was going too much over the children's heads, you know, age wise, mm -hmm. that that it was yeah, more right. fun for the parents and the caregivers. But the kids, you know, the kids wouldn't relate to it. I don't know. But I, I don't think they do those parodies anymore. Do you know? No, no, I don't think they do. No, they don't. No, I don't think they do. Because no, really since the show's like a half hour now, I think they don't really have yeah, the time to yeah. fit a lot of that stuff in. Well, well, that, oh, that, and and also the reason you mentioned like, yeah, the the adults would get it, kids not so much. No, right, but that's what the celebrities are too. They don't know who Robin Williams is, you know. Right, or, right. Uh, that you've got to have that stuff for the caregivers. Right. But some of those parodies we did were just way, way over the kids heads i mean we loved doing them because they were so funny um, uh -huh. yeah, yeah you know every time there's a change in the executive producers or anything like that they throw out what they don't think works or what they think is just too um too smart too savvy 
for a child who's three, four years old, and they're probably right. But therefore, it's funny for the adults that are watching and for the performers. Right. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Right. So now um, one of the projects Zoe was featured prominently in was the movie The Adventures of Emma oh, yeah. and Grouchland. What was it like getting to, you know, to work on that movie? Uh, well, it was kind of fun. We went to Wilmington, Delaware, where they have this incredible soundstage uh, studio, probably more than one soundstage, and they put us up in a um, kind of a motel-like place that I remember the smell of mold was very, very prominent because uh, it was like wet all the time from the beach and the air. It was just one of those places that you knew had mildew in it. Uh, that's one thing I remember. And I had known uh, Mandy Patinkin from New York because I was an actress in New York and I, I knew him and he knew me. And, uh, you know, it was great having him do that. And uh, I thought it was a really cute script. <clears throat> and uh, I liked the whole blanket flying away, all of that, that which was the plot line, of course, for Zoe. So um, what do I remember about that? I don't know, long days. It's a, it's a right to work state meaning there it's non-union so you could work really late into the night without um being paid for it both as a performer or as a hairdresser or a sound guy you know it's it's one of those non-union shops so i think that's why they shot it down there because it costs probably a lot less money than if they had shot it in new york I don't re really remember much about it except the trash heap. Didn't they create this great trash heap in Elmo and Grouchland? Yeah, you know? yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That came alive. I mean, there were puppeteers mm -hmm. in the trash heap. Yeah, and yeah. Whoever was the female performer, celebrity person, she sang a song uh, with the trash or around the trash. Mm -hmm. I haven't seen that movie since we shot it. That's been a while. Oh, wow. Yeah. So I don't I don't go back seeing this stuff really ever. <laughs> <laughs> so moving on to some of your other uh, Sesame characters, you also in the eighties and nineties performed a character, Polly Darton. Mm -hmm. What well, mm -hmm. what was it like performing her? Uh you know, I love it anytime I can sing as somebody other than myself. And uh, so obviously I just copied Polly Darton, I uh, mean, Dolly Parton, <laughs> in my own way. Uh, she really didn't have, she was not a three-dimensional character. She was just a character with a big wig on and uh, who sang country music, you know. Um, but uh, mm -hmm. she wasn't anyone I was particularly fond of. I mean, I enjoyed doing her, but, um, uh, uh, you know, she wasn't like, a, uh, I didn't feel anything about her. Let's put it that way. Right. Uh, Makes sense. Because she didn't last thing. for very long. She, no, she only, did, a, she only one, did like a couple songs here and there. And it's a it's a one joke thing, you know, yeah. to, to do, it's like uh, Placido Flamingo. Remember him? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. You know. You write a few shows, but the, it's not it's not a fully rounded character that you can put in many scenarios. Uh, it's a one trick pony character. Right. Yeah. Definitely. Yep. Yep. Now you had brought up uh, Roxy Marie earlier, who was yeah. uh, main mainly during the Around the Corner era. Uh, okay. For those who don't know, Around the Corner was. Uh, in the mid '90s, and it didn't last very long, as we mentioned earlier. How did right. Roxy Marie? How did Ro Roxy Marie come about? You know, all I remember is um, they had this puppet that had red hair. I I think they were just huh. probably trying to come up with another female character that I could do, uh, and then she became. Um, Biff's niece 
which I really thought was a great idea. And then I said, you know, there's not one puppet that wears glasses. Why don't we put a pair of glasses on her? So they did that. And then they put a backpack on her. And then she became a smart little girl, a smart little girl who loves books and wears glasses. You know, it's funny how these things come first. It's, uh, you know, I can't remember if it's the, the chicken or the egg, but yeah. that character just sort of grew by a couple of different ideas thrown in. And I love that relationship with Jerry because um, Biff was just a really great guy. He just didn't know a lot. He wasn't, you know, learned. He probably hadn't gone to college. Uh, he was a, a laborer, you know. Um, he was a guy that worked on, in the streets, you know, with a helmet on, a protective helmet. So when he, and I, I know Jerry liked doing those scenes with me too. So this very warm relationship developed between them where he could learn from her without feeling embarrassed that he didn't know what she taught him. And she would never make fun of him that he didn't know it. So I always thought that was just a, just a lovely relationship between a man and his niece. Um, she knew about butterflies. She knew about, oh God, what were the other things she liked? Hmm, can't remember. But, but there was always a teaching element to it where yeah. she would say to Uncle Biff, well, you know, it's not quite that way. It's this way. Or, I mean, help me out here. Do you remember any better than I do? It, it just, it, I thought it was great for Jerry as a puppeteer to play that character. And, oh, Sully was the other uh, construction worker. And that was Richard Hunt. That's how that came about. They, the two of them were there first as construction workers. And then they decided to make um, Roxy Biff's niece. Definitely, yeah. There was, a, there was a Roxy Marie episode, I remember. I think it was a butterfly one you mentioned because I watched a little bit of it. And one of our uh, previous guests, Juju Papaye, who played Jamal, was on that episode. I'm sorry. One of the, one of the uh, human cast members. Okay. All right. And did he talk about it when when you spoke to him? I don't. I don't. Th I don't think he did. But I watched uh, like a like the street scenes of it to prepare for that interview. I see. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I I don't remember. You know who was writing those particular scripts or how that evolved. Mm -hmm. Um. No but. That's uh, good. It was, it was, I think whenever you can have puppets demonstrate a behavior that is positive, then it's a good thing to write about it, you know, where they are yeah. gentle or kind or instructive in a, I, I, not, not in an, I know better than you do mode, but in a gentle, caring, well, you might want to know this, you know, kind of mode. Um, then that's, that's what those puppets are there for. Right. Yeah. Definitely. On an educational children's show. Definitely. So some of your other more kind of uh, recurring characters include uh, the Countess and Mrs. Crossworthy. What, can you talk a bit about those characters? Yeah, sure. Well, the Countess originally was done by Carmen. Oh, was, was it Carmen? Was that her name? Do you know the puppeteer? Um, oh, God. I'm drawing a blank. She, when I was not puppeteering, she, Camille, Cam, Camille Bonara. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. yeah. 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 I just yeah. loved her. A great girl and a wonderful puppeteer. She was the first person to do the Countess, I think. So when she got married and left, uh, then I got the Countess, which was a very heavy puppet, I'm sorry to say, with a big wig looks like, yeah big wig look yeah. like it yeah <laughs> a killer a killer puppet and um 
but that again was nice because I always liked working with Jerry and he was such a wonderful singer. And oh my gosh, um, I his performance as a count was just like no other. Like, it... I know he, he was just super duper. Well, he was, you know, he mm -hmm. as I was, he was an actor first and then transitioned into a puppeteer. But he was a he was an actor. He had a career and he was a, a good actor. Um, but then he tripped and fell into the puppetry world as I did. But then again, you use those skills. So it just right. informed yeah. the puppet even more than somebody who wasn't an actor, maybe. So um, she was hard to do. I mean, not the voice, but just keeping my arm up with this incredibly heavy thing hitting, you know, it's, it's, where are where am I here? Uh, you know, hitting up here. Yeah, yeah. Your, oh, yeah. That's what hurts so much. And then your oh. upper, we're here, the the between your wrist and your elbow. Um, you know, the opposite of a prairie dawn, basically. Right. Um. So yeah, we I got can tell you a good anecdote about doing her. Um, we were doing a not a satire but a takeoff on the song from Gigi oh yes I remember it well which is from the musical Gigi mm -hmm. before your time but anyway a nice musical nice movie um so they wrote that for the countess and the count and you know in the puppeteering world there's we are lip syncing to the pre-record and you know it's it's countless pro technical problems that you have to think of you know not crossing in front of each other on the camera and anyway we were shooting this thing and we were doing a lot of takes on it and it got to the point where and and all that lip syncing while you're so your hand is still moving like crazy uh all of a sudden i my hand and arm just froze up so over the years you got to work with many of the celebrities who, who have come on who are some of your favorite celebrities you, you work with um i think maya angelou was one of them um because i i have read a great i can't say everything but a great deal of what she's written and i had enormous respect for her so that was um very cool um, and let's see. Well, Zoe did a show with Christopher Reeve, uh, before he passed away. And, um, that was, that was pretty amazing because he was completely paralyzed at that time. And, um, cause he had a riding accident and fell. And so he spent the rest of his life paralyzed. And um, it was a show with Zoe and um, Chris. And his son came, who was about 10, maybe 10 years old. And the, ever though the producers were, you know, I wouldn't say nervous about his coming, but, but very concerned. And uh, they had to keep the temperature of the studio at a certain coolness so that he wouldn't get overheated and uh we were told don't touch him and you know it was very different than somebody who was able-bodied who was a guest on the show so he put everybody at ease because he came onto the set in this very complicated um uh, what would you call it um well, you know, I don't know what. He was like half lying in it and he was blowing into a straw and that would be what ambulated this contraption he was in. It was like a wheelchair, but it was more more complicated than that. And uh, so he, he just blew into that thing and said, hello, everybody. And, you know, he kind of took over in this very magnanimous way to say, don't worry, I know I look weird, but it's me inside. I mean, all of that was sort of the subtext. So he made everybody feel comfortable and he rolled on and then he met Zoe. And, you know, of course I'm down at his knees on the floor. And um, I guess we ran through the script a little, a couple of times and, the script was to explain 
why he was in this contraption. And he said it in a very matter of fact way. You know, he wasn't feeling sorry for himself, but this is what happened. And so, yes, now he has to be in this contraption. And that was not the word he used, but I'm using it. And uh, so at one point when we were rehearsing, I think I, I just bit the bullet and said, would you mind or is it okay if I have Zoe kind of sit in your lap? Because it's going to look so much cuter and better if, mm -hmm. you know, she has that proximity to him. And he said, oh, no, no, that's fine. That's fine. So I did. I just put my elbow on the contraption or whatever it was and, you know, was up there where I could talk to him. So that was kind of cool. And um, let's see, who else? I don't know. There have just been so many people. <laughs> Um, well, I guess, you know, Beyonce is, of course, huge now. Oh, yeah. she, she and the original group, which was, um, uh, ooh, does anybody remember what that shoot? It was three. Beyonce. Destiny's Child. Yeah. Yeah, Destiny's Child, yeah. Destiny's mm -hmm. Child. Yeah, yeah. yeah, one of the songs they did, the, 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 where they did, I got a new way to walk, yes. Uh, yeah. yes. Yes. Yeah, you're that's right. So that's right. So they were on. So that was a big deal, but not as it would be now. That's for sure. Right. Um, right. I don't know. That's all I can think of at the moment. Um, let's see. Who else was fun? Um, well, of course, when she was a little girl, Dakota Fanning, who's now a grown up lady, Dakota oh. Fanning. I worked with her. Um, hmm. Yeah, I don't know. That's that's all I can come up with at the moment, celebrity wise. Um, I'm sure there is a ton other. What else have you got? Well, on the subject of celebrities, Zoe had her own home video, Zoe's Dance Moves, which oh, featured right. Paula Abdul. Yes. Yeah, I, I, I see, that was a really fun one to watch. Uh, just yeah, just the yeah, choreography. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, that was, that, there was a lot of people worked on that who were unseen. Yeah, uh, yeah. yeah at the end, uh, that whole dance they do when they put all of the parts of the choreography together. Uh -huh. There was somebody doing Zoe's feet, somebody, two other people doing her arms. And I was, you know, my hand, my right hand was in the head uh that that was that was difficult and we we had to rehearse that quite a bit um but paula was great lovely lovely gal very tiny little woman but she knew her stuff um in fact i think they had come up with the choreography and sent it to her so she could learn it so that they wouldn't waste time when she got to the set so she came on very well prepared and um she was delightful she was a lot of fun to work with oh yeah and, she's she's okay. awesome and and, and yeah, yeah. She, is, and she was she was an american idol judge as well oh yeah that's, that's right. right yes yeah 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 yeah. she keeps pretty busy you know she's been yeah, in the still is. but but i do remember one since we're going to be like uh moving on with the sesame things one of the songs i remember that you they i know you do mass as well um one of the songs you actually were part of which was for J jerry nelson like one of his songs a little, little red oh, right. oh little red yes that's right yes jerry's album you mean the, yeah the, uh -huh. yes yeah the big bad jerry's wolf yeah, yeah. Right. which is a that, great album by the way yes it is. oh yes very mm -hmm. um another very moving day in my life I remember it, rain, it was raining like crazy and a lot of people had come just to watch the recording happen. They weren't in it or anything. The word got out that we were doing this and uh, Jerry was not in good shape, but gosh, I mean, he just pulled himself together and turned out these songs and some of his buddies playing behind him and it was a very, very special day. Oh, well, look at that. Oh, I bet it, it was. It was That's a cute. very, very special day. 
And uh, yeah, I remember recording that song with Kevin for sure. Yeah, yeah. Yes, very fun song. Uh, uh, again, certainly a fantastic, beautiful album. Uh, yeah. Is it a, is it available on streaming or anything? Do you know? Wow. That that then, that, uh, that I don't know. I I don't do know. You know the I, name I of it. I mean, uh, I have... the uh, the name's blanking on me at the moment. Uh, Jakey, mm. do you do you do you know the name of Jerry Nelson's album? Do you know? Oh, um the. Um, the the ter- the ter- it's you're right. It's got a Turo 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 Daydreams. Yes, Turo Daydreams. Yes, he had Daydreams. House in Cape Cod, and that's mm-hmm. where he would spend the off time. Uh, oh wow! Yeah, yeah, in Truro on the Cape. So, huh. so, and he belonged to a, a musical group that performed on the Cape. Uh, just for fun, you know, just his buddies, and a lot of whom were at the recording session, recording with him. And uh, so he had like these two lives. It was the puppetry job, but also making music with his buddies on the Cape, Cape Cod. So, um, and Truro is where it all happened. It's just a small town on Cape Cod. So, yeah, which we all went to at one point, I think when Jerry was ill and we went to hear him perform. I know Frank was there and Matt was there. Yeah, and Carol. Who? Carol? And Carol Spinney. He might have been. I don't remember, but there were a bunch of us that came up to hear him at the club that he played in. Uh, and music was just an enormous part of his life. He really was a very talented singer, composer. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, very gifted fella. Oh yeah, it's absolutely, and, and I know he will never forgotten them up in New York. No, nope. no, no, you know, no. Wait, wait, for what he's done for Frogger Walk and Count, you know, Richard everything Rose. else. So, oh, you so know. much. That's so right. Much. All the Fraggle Rock stuff too, right? Yeah, yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. So much. Uh, yeah, and, and and funny enough, so you mentioned Cape Cape Cod, which I, I know Jerry, you know. Last year's of his life, he went to live at Cape Cod. Fun fact, which which, which fun fact that Chris actually actually lives at Cape Cod, Massachusetts. That's right. That's right. That's right. Uh, why is you he not did- here? I don't know. No, we we wish we did. Uh, Jake and I are in Maryland. We're about a half uh, hour and a half away from each other. Yeah, and and that Chris, thing- our other co-host, is up in Cape Cod. Oh, okay. Yeah, okay. And, and and both me and Matt are actually going to meet up each other in the next nine days. Oh, yes. really? Yeah, yeah, we're meeting yes. up in person. Uh, yes. There's a there's a, a Jim Henson exhibition going on right now at here. Uh, what's it called? Uh, uh, the uh, Imagination Maryland. Unlimited. Yes. Uh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh, that's a very nice exhibit. Oh yes. yes. Oh yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, we're uh, we're meet, we're meeting up with we're meeting up with a few friends of ours. Uh, they're all coming to, to yeah. um, our neck of the woods. Pretty yes. much, yeah. I'm, I'm like I'm like 15, 20 minutes away from there. I'm really, really excited about it. Oh you know, yeah, it's gonna be it's gonna be wonderful. It'd be fun I day think these craft exhibits are wonderful for the people. Absolutely. Who can't come. Yeah, to we've we've show. we've been we we've been seeing a lot of photos of it. It looks amazing. Mm-hmm. Really does, yes. and I think, and I think the museum of the moving image has something to do with it too. I can't remember what exactly. Yeah, it, uh-huh. something to do. One of the it. traveling. Uh, there, there are a couple of those around because I, I, yeah. I was sent to uh, Arizona to Mesa, where I don't know if it was that exhibit or another exhibit, but I went there. And where else have I gone with it? Uh, anyway, I, I think I know the one that it is, but I'm glad that it's still traveling around. That's that's super. It's oh, sort yes. of great. Yeah, in Henson's it's, world, it's amazing. Yeah, yes. yeah great, it's yeah, it's it's mm-hmm. out here until the end of the until, year. Right? Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah, the yeah. end of the year. Mm-hmm. Yeah, right. right. Yes. So, so if you want to a chance to see it, it's uh, the Jim Henson exhibition, Imagination Unlimited, currently at the Maryland Center for History and Culture. If you're listening to this in 2024, don't worry about it. <laughs> right? <laughs> don't worry about it. Cause it'll be gone by then. You missed it. So. To anyone watching or listening, what would you like to say to those who have been supported you throughout your career for all those years? 
oh, well, thank you. <laughs> you know, I I feel like they supported the show, not me so much, but um, I think it's great that so many of you uh, watch the show, are still watching the show, still learning and enjoying the show. That's that's fantastic. Um, and uh, it certainly was a nice ride for me. And uh, I hope that it has helped you become kinder and smarter and sensitive to other people, um, no matter who they are. And um, that you learned about being part of the world and what your place in the world is and how caring and helping other people is really one of the best things you can do. Um, I learned that. Certainly I had one of the great teachers who was Jim Henson, who really shaped my life and- Absolutely. Um, yeah. I'm, not, I'm not too sure poetry would be like this now if it wasn't for Jim. Uh -uh. Right, well, I have no idea, right. But also, you know, who he was, uh, the way he treated people and, uh, you know, the, the, the goodness and kindness from him continues on and on long after his death, which I think is great. Uh, I think he probably affected a, just an enormous amount of people indirectly or directly. And that's a great thing. I think that all of us are like, including you guys, are like seedlings of Jim Henson and his belief system and his worldview and that we all pass along all of the thoughts and dreams that he had about making the world a little bit better for his being around. Uh, you know, why waste it? Why not do something good with your life? So I'm, I feel very fortunate to have been part of that. Absolutely. Absolutely. A pleasure. Yes, definitely a pleasure indeed. So, all right. So if people would like to connect with you, where can people find you? Oh, uh, well, I have a website called uh, franbrill.com, oddly, and uh, they can uh, write to me there. Nice. And link to that awesome. will be in the description. www.franbrill.com. Yes, right. and, your, and, your, and your website will be social down below so people can, you know, you know check it out or, or connect. Mm -hmm. Yes. All right. This last question we're about that uh, Chris is about to ask, we ask uh, to every, uh, pretty much every guest. Go ahead, Chris. Yeah. So, of course, you know, this podcast is called Jake's Happy Nostalgia Show. When you think of nostalgia, in your own words, how would, how would you kind of define nostalgia? Like, what does nostalgia mean to you? Uh, it's just nostalgia is warm feelings about something that you knew or thought of that was in the past. Great words then, Don, definitely. Oh, yes. Well, Fran, thank you so much for taking time to do this. This was a blast. Yeah, you're very yes. welcome. Yes. yes, and thank you very yes. much, you know, for, for, for what you've done for, you know, Sesame Street um, and all things to be a part of our lives. Sure. And sure. thank you for what you've done. You're, yes. you're very welcome. Good luck to you guys. Thank, thank you. you. It means a lot, yeah. Fran. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Enjoy Take the rest of your day, friend. Bye. Bye. Take care, friend. See ya. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Wow, what a great chat wow. that was. We absolutely enjoyed our time with yes. really one of the Sesame Legends, Fran Brill. Yes, yes. And and uh, this also concludes our anniversary month, folks. Yes, this Yes, it officially concludes our anniversary month. Yes, taping um, wise, you've seen our interviews with DJ Bob, DJ Cam Bob, Garrity, Cam Austin Garrity. Costello. Yep, and now Fran. Uh, now Fran, I, and I so that concludes and Bruce. our and Bruce. Yes, and Bruce, of course. But that concludes our second anniversary uh, airings. Um, of course, more wonderful interviews to come your way. And as yes. always, take us home, Jake. What do we say? Keep nostalgia alive. Take care, everyone. See you next time. And. Oh, oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> Bye, everyone. Bye. 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 Thank you for tuning in to another wonderful Jake's Happy Nostalgia Show interview. Be sure to follow Jake and the crew on social media and stream the show wherever you find your favorite podcasts. And as always, remember to keep nostalgia alive. Bye-bye. <laughs>